five, four, three, two, one. The Sofa Club is live. Hello and welcome to Peccadillo Sofa Club. Um, we're looking at, uh, we've all been watching already uh, before Stonewall and enjoying this incredible um, and important film. Uh, my name is Justin Bengry. I convene the MA Queer History at Goldsmiths and I'm absolutely honored to be joined today with creators of Before Stonewall to, to discuss the film and discuss its production and its importance. and. Um, how they went about creating this this remarkable uh, archive of LGBTQ history itself. Um, for those of you that are watching us live, you can also contribute questions and contribute to the conversation um, using the hashtag uh, the hashtag Peccadillo Sofa Club um, through through Twitter, through Instagram, through Facebook, and we'll have those questions fed through to our uh, our guests as well. So, as I said, I'm joined with. Well, three really remarkable people, and I'm so glad that you could join me today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for yeah. having this event. We're glad to be here. So let me just quickly introduce you. Um, we have Greta Schiller, an award-winning independent producer and director of documentary films. She's received numerous film festival awards and other honors, including two Emmys. Uh, Greta uh, directed and co-produced before Stonewall. With her is Andrea Weiss, an internationally acclaimed documentary filmmaker and nonfiction author, likewise the winner of numerous honors, including a Lambda Literary Award. Trained as an historian, she's professor of film at the City College of New York, and she was research director on Before Stonewall. And we also have Jewel Gomez, author and activist for feminist and LGBTQ issues, particularly interested um, in race and gender, who's worked across academia, media, and philanthropy. Uh, Jewel was a researcher uh, on Before Stonewall and did several of the interviews as well. Um, this only touches on the remarkable accolades of the three women that I'm joined by today. So I encourage you all to Google the three of them and learn so much more about their, their the amazing work they've done in our communities for decades and decades. So um, all the more thank you to uh, all three of you for what you've done beyond the film. Thank you. Thank you. So we have really a lot to talk about with this film. I've enjoyed some conversations that we've had already um, as we've gotten to know each other in the preparation for this evening. Um, but it was just such an experience for me as an historian to, uh, to watch before Stonewall because we're aware, I suppose, more and more of the recent LGBTQ past, but I think there's still a lot of silences. Even now, 35 years after this film was made, a lot of silences and lack of knowledge about all the work that was done before that, the people who came before the activists at Stonewall and after, um, and what kinds of expressions of sexuality and gender difference there were throughout human history. Um, and so your film is really a contribution in so many ways that continues to be, to be incredibly important. Um, I guess, first of all, I'd be really interested in hearing more uh, about what what inspired you to make this film at this point in the early and mid 1980s? What was going on in the in the context of that moment that inspired this this creation? Well, before Stonewall was my first feature as a director. Um, so, but I was inspired by a couple of in the in the late 70s, early 80s. There was a burgeoning like independent film movement uh, that was looking at mostly leftists and women's history. There was Julia Reichardt's Union Maids uh, and then Seeing Red and then Third World Newsreel was making films about the black community. Kartemkwin Films made uh, was making films in Chicago. Uh, Rosie the Riveter about women during World War II came out in 1980. Word is Out came out in 19. 80, I think it was. Word of Doubt, of course, was really influential, but it was just contemporary. It was just homosexuals talking about their lives for the very first time. So um, we, that's what we were, that was, those films were the, what led to sort of the idea that there could be a film about gay and lesbian history. And initially the idea was to uh, uh, make it about the homophile movement using the incredible work of John D'Amelio. But it became quickly clear that we wanted to make it, for me, I was really interested in 
not just the movement, but really the ordinary lives of gay and lesbian people. And we decided to go from the turn of the century, which is essentially when the idea of homosexuality as an identity as opposed to a sex act, to the birth of the modern gay liberation movement of 1969. So that's, that's it in summary. Well, and you mentioned the uh, uh, having a whole range of people involved, and I think that's one of the the strengths of the of the film. Um, can you talk more about just that that range of people from 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 the greats of, of 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 activist movements to ordinary people on the ground and experiencing day to day life, but also the diversity of people that participated in uh, in the film? Well, one thing is that my co-producers and I, uh, and Andrea's research director. We were very committed from the beginning to include, you know, to, to, to tell the story of that the gay and lesbian community is not just a white phenomenon. And I, I think I, I grew up in a very, uh, in a working class, mixed race, politicized, housing project on the outskirts of a university town. So I think the idea of intersectionality just came, it was just an organic part of, of who, who I was. And so I think that informed the whole research. And then um, I'll let Andrea describe, we had, we had people working all over the country. But one thing and how Jewel got involved was that I was very committed to actually having people of color actually doing, being involved in the research and in the production and not just taking ideas and taking people's lives and, you know, telling it my own way. That was really important to me. Andrea, could you, you and Jewel both talk a bit more about the process of the research that, uh, um, that Greta's introduced uh, you, as research director and research on this and just finding all of these people as well? Well, I would just jump in to say, you know, you have to imagine there was, of course, no internet. Um, and mm -hmm. <laughs> if you can remember back, there was no internet. <laughs> so we did a lot of things the old fashioned way with like an envelope and a stamp or the telephone. Um, but we had local researchers and we had someone in Chicago, we had someone in San Francisco, someone in Seattle, different cities. I can't remember all See, the cities. I think it was Atlanta, Los Angeles. Seattle, Chicago, and New York. And L.A. And L.A. So at least those and maybe a couple of others. But um, but we basically um, had local people and we told them what we wanted to find, which was a range of people who were living, you know, openly um, lesbian and gay lives before Stonewall, open within the context of what was possible in, you know, in their communities and their families and so on. And um, so we had a whole, and we also had, it was a pretty robust um, lesbian and gay press at the time, like that sort of alternative lesbian gay newspapers. So we would put little announcements in the press saying, you know, we're looking for people. And we'd have these local researchers on the ground looking for people. And we had a lot of um, names kind of fed to us. And then we would do pre-interviews because we were shooting on film, which was extremely expensive. So we did pre-interviews. Jewel did a number of those, I know. And um, and from there, Greta chose which people would appear in the film. But the other thing I just want to say before I hand this over to Jewel to give more detail about it was that inevitably, um, you know, people who've lived, you know, before Stonewall were not necessarily that eager to mm. be, you know, talking about their lives they've been they had a whole life lived of pretty you know private existence so the ones who were of course most vocal were white men so we had an overwhelming number of, of white men relative to everybody else and um so we we had to really um you know be careful and make sure that the people that actually were going to be interviewed on film for the interviewed on film for the film really were representative of lesbian and gay life before Stonewall and not just the people who kind of were clamoring to appear in the film. 
It, I mean, we had a very loose historical outline, so it was like decade by decade, and then we then we literally had like index cards, and we said, okay, these are the things we want to highlight about this period, and we also wanted to obviously gay people live among in society, so. Um, we wanted to tie it into the Roaring Twenties or the Great Depression or the World War II and how that affected uh, gay people. And so we would say, okay, well, we have, you know, we have, we literally, we, it, I mean, it was kind of like, I, I, it's pretty amazing when I think of it. We literally would say, okay, we have, we don't have enough uh, people of color to talk about this period of history, or we don't have enough women. And we would just, and then we would just say, we have to look for them because we could have really easily made it much more male focused because, because of history and women, lesbians are women and women's stories are not as told and women often had more to lose um, and were less financially secure. and. Which isn't to say, you know, gay men had horrible things, bar raids and loss of jobs and, you know, we, you know, all the all that bad, bad stuff, which some people still experience. Yeah. But, Julie, you want to tell some of your fabulous stories? Of <laughs> yeah, absolutely, Jewel. <laughs> you want to one of the first things I remember from one of our first meetings is I had, and this is the thing about low tech that's interesting. I mean, this was a time where you could look someone up. Uh, you could call information and get somebody's phone number, somebody, <laughs> you know, and just call them on the telephone or write them a letter. So that was really kind of bizarre. <laughs> but I think it was effective because a lot of the people were more private and a little bit more anxious. So receiving a letter felt safer um, than if. It were now and you got an email. You just, it, it felt safer. Anyway, um, I remember the first meeting I was at and I was taking notes and I ended up with a yellow pad, almost the whole yellow pad with people's names. Because every time you said a name, oh, we should use this person, we should use that person. So I'm writing them all down and I'm thinking, oh God, it's going to take 10 years to make this movie. Because <laughs> there just were so many people. Um, and then, but it was the narrowing it down to different events in history that really focused the film. And I, I think that was one of the most important elements of the film, um, connecting gay people to the larger world. And I think too often that's not what happens. You know, we are not given any kind of historical context. So when you were talking about World War II and you wanted to hear about um, how people were dealing with being in the military or not, um, you, you really needed to be talking to gay people about that. And, and often you wouldn't. Um, when you were talking about the Harlem Renaissance, you need to be talking about the gay people. And I think that helped give us this format that we could then plug in. We need more of this, more of that. Um, and that was really, I think, one of the amazing things about the film. So one of my favorite uh, pre-interviews, I wish we had filmed the pre-interview. You know, if we were doing it now, I would have videotaped the whole day. I, uh, Mabel Hampton, who... Uh, was at that time in her 70s, I'm thinking, and she had been very close. She was very close to Joan Nessel, who was one of the co-founders of the Lesbian History Archives in New York City. And she marched every year with uh, the archives, and she's African-American, and, and, well, you saw the film. So, and she's this little tiny person. And she had been a dancer in the 20s and 30s and had a lover uh, for, I don't know, 40 or more years who she met uh, on a, a at a trolley car stop, which she was very, very uh, excited that she got to tell that story. And so she uh, said, well, I said, well, I would I called her and said, I would like to do this uh, conversation with you just to see what the things are you'd be interested in talking with. 
Um, so she says, okay, well, Sunday, come to my house. And I said, okay. And I took my then uh, partner, the poet Cheryl Clark, and I said, we're going to go to Mabel Hampton's house up uptown. And she, and then Mabel called me back and said, I'm going to make a lunch. I said, oh, that's lovely. You don't have to do that. Why don't I bring it? No, no. So we go up there. Mabel has made a spread. You would think we were going to be there for two days. <laughs> She's made fried chicken and macaroni salad and salad salad. I mean, she just cooked forever. It was so sweet. And her apartment, she had one of those big old New York apartments. It was so hot. You, you could like you could barely keep your eyes open. It was so hot. So <laughs> then we ate all this heavy food. And then she said, well, you need to take a nap before dessert. <laughs> I'm coming up here to interview you. I can't take a nap. <laughs> she says, no, no, no. You, just, you go in there and you take a nap. So we laid down and we did fall out unconscious. And so finally, about an hour, she came and got us and said, okay. She put out the dessert. She made bread pudding. I mean, she was just going to town. And so I said, well, Mabel, I do have to ask you some questions. <laughs> and she said, go ahead, gal. You can ask me anything you want. I said, well, that's the spirit we're looking for. <laughs> and you know, she was the kind of person, and I think you probably found this when you did the interview. If you started her talking, she was off like a shot. And she had a really good memory. Uh, she, was, she had worked for one of the famous... Uh, women who was a uh, uh, fashionista. Uh, she had worked for a famous perfumer. So she knew a lot of the dirt about who was gay in the 30s, uh, who was a lesbian in the 30s. And she was so proud, specifically, that she had survived all of that secret life and got to march in a parade every year. She was very proud of that. So she was a wonderful bridge, I think, from the past to the present. Mm -hmm. and she's I've never had a lunch like that since. <laughs> <laughs> I, I once ran into when the gay men's health crisis, they one time had a benefit, and it was the entire uh, Barnum and Bailey Circus at Madison Square Garden. And I ran into Mabel uh, in the oh. bathroom, and she said, Girl, don't you think there's more men than women here? Where's all the women? And I was like, point. But, you know, it was a gay men's health crisis. It was so just, just adorable. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it yeah. makes such a difference, of course, to get uh, these these dynamic people that have important stories, but also these great ways of telling them. And, and certainly this mimics my experience doing oral history interviews that just it can go anywhere with uh, with uh, lesbian and gay people when you're when you're meeting them and learning about their past and learning their stories. This mm. is something that you've 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 all brought up um, this this importance of of having a history and what an important thing this film has done to show people they had a history. Um, that, 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 that it goes back and that there are forebears and there are people like them in the past, people like Mabel, that someone sees themselves in her look, uh, watching this, uh, this film. Um, we've got some questions already coming in from people and uh, um, people are curious about the uh, uh, interview, uh, interview partners. Um, George is asking if you're still in contact with anyone that you, that you interviewed or if you know where their paths went. Um, did you ever consider doing a, a follow-up after Stonewall with any of these people or others? Well, unfortunately, I mean, the film was made in the, we did most of the interviews in the 82, 83. So, all right, so and most of the people were already in their 50s, 60s, or 70s. So when we did the re-release a year ago now, June, boy, I can't believe it's a year ago. Um, we looked for who was still alive and, and, uh, Robert Rosenberg found Marge Summit in Chicago, the bar owner, and she apparently attended a Q&A. And then we found um, Ann Bannon, the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the author, but she was too old to come to anything. She said she didn't travel anymore. And Marty Duberman is hanging in there. He's not that well. And I, I, is there anyone else who's still? Yeah, there's... Um Ivy Bettini. Ivy Bettini. Yeah. Yeah. She also was yeah. uh, unwell. And, and, and that's it as far as we know. I don't think that anyone yeah. else is still alive. So, yeah. yeah. Um, we did and stay in touch with a number of them for, oh, yeah. for quite a yeah. while afterwards. Yeah. But, yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, all the more reason that the film is so important because you're capturing a moment in time before people just left us. And, you know, I mean, I, I stayed in touch with Babel because I had actually met her before and uh, I actually served as one of her pallbearers. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Is that she was, that was, huh? Where is she? In the Bronx. In the Bronx. Um, with that big cemetery that's right off of the, the 59th Street Bridge. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, what's his name? Bruce Nugent. Bruce Nugent, I yeah. I kept in contact with him a little bit. And his friend, the fellow who organized him a lot. Uh, yeah. Uh, I got blanking on his name, but he he had been Bruce's friend. And he actually ended up, I think, writing a book about Bruce. Um, so I kept in contact with them a little bit. Barbara Greer, of course, uh, donated to the San Francisco Public Library all of her archives mm-hmm. and her books. Mm-hmm. And that forms the core of the James Hormel LGBTQ archives in the San Francisco Public Library. And it's the first archives of its kind, I think, in the world in a public library. Uh, But she donated all of her books, all of her papers, everything. Um, So that was a that was a huge deal. Um, now that's really important cool to have those 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 materials preserved and saved and archived. And I really appreciated what you said, Jewel, about uh, uh, about the importance of the film in recording these recording these voices and recording um, these stories of people that um, well we don't have any longer. Um, yeah. I'm wondering to what extent you all thought about the film at the time as creating an archive itself. You were drawing upon so many archives in research and doing really deep work that was it's much easier now <laughs> to find many of these things well that, that, that's an interesting thing because first of all we were i mean i, I was in my mid-20s so i didn't really think mm. in that way mm. and i'm not a trained historian and um but the, all the outs and the pre-interviews that did exist they ended up like in the executive producers barn in vermont and just before the the pandemic pause, Andrea was in touch with him and is they're working to try and reconstitute and get that back, that material, which we couldn't put in the film, available to people like yourself because mm-hmm. it's very important. It's very important, but you know, we went on and made lots of movies and just didn't think in that way. Although uh, uh, Andrea and I were, uh, it's not directly to Stonewall, but the Smith Women's College Archive. Right. Asked for all of our material, and there's a lot of the research from before Stonewall and all the other films we've made that are there, which are starting to be available for mm-hmm. researchers. No, that's I know great. from remember it was shot on 16 millimeters, so the things were like cut up. If we hadn't been thinking archive, we would have transferred all of those, you know, straight to another format before we started cutting it. But we weren't thinking that way. We were also doing the film on a shoestring. I probably couldn't have afforded to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it's a lot of times people are in the midst of something revolutionary and it's hard to know at the time that it's revolutionary, you know. No idea. I, I had, uh, you know, some film experience and some television experience, but nothing, well, in 68, and I worked for WGBH, which is a public television station, in Boston, and we worked. I worked for an all-black TV show, which was very dramatic, very historic. Um, but I had not had any media experience after that. You know, I worked for Children's Television Workshop. You know, Sesame Street. Really? Um, so this working on Before Stonewall was like the first time in maybe a decade that I had done anything not a decade, but because I was also young, um, that I had done anything that exciting or meaningful, you know? Uh, so it was hard to reflect on it as meaningful as it was. You just kind of drop in it. You're going to get it done no matter what. <laughs> and, you know, yeah, it is too bad, but I'm glad that there's going to be some attempt to capture that archival material. 
um, to have it go somewhere as opposed to a barn in Vermont. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's something several questions have been coming up asking about that. Clearly, it struck a chord that people want to know more, that it uh, uh, inspired in them a curiosity um, to know more. So I'm glad to know about the Smith Archive that holds the uh, uh, production information that you mentioned. And then did you say what happened to all of the uh, the actual interviews themselves? Well, we, we, we recently found the, um, some material, some of the, I just actually just found on VHS, full, like, 10 of the interviews in the full length. So I'm um, mm. going soon to get those put into on a digital format for people for research. But, you know, everything costs money and time, and I haven't gotten to it. But I do plan on doing with that. And I think we found the original reel-to-reel -reel tapes, the full, complete tapes of the interviews. So, again, I just we just have to reconnect with John Scagliotti and get that stuff out of his barn. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> It's a process. <laughs> yeah, no, and, there's, and there's real issues in just creating that and taking the time and the resources that go into into further work to do that. So I'm sure we all thank you for the efforts that that takes. But one thing that's exciting is there are young people uh, who are interested, and a young man who is a student at the City University has recently approached us and said he's willing to do a lot of that grunt work around it because he's very excited, and that is really wonderful. Absolutely. Uh, what would uh, what would you do differently um, if you made the film today? Um, what uh, how how would you do it? How would you create it differently? Who what stories might you include differently now? Is there anything that you would uh, uh, reconsider uh, uh, how you might go about doing it now? Not really. No. Well, there's one thing I would me say. personally. No. <laughs> I I have. I hadn't seen the film for years, and it was when it was shown in the Berlin Film Festival a few years ago in retrospective, and that's what got me where I had to go and make the DCP and put it into a new technology. And I saw it with an audience, and I was like, "Wow, this movie's pretty good." And the audience thought, "Wow, <laughs> this movie's pretty good." So you know, I don't really revisit my own films. You know, I don't but think I, that. Way. I don't know if the question is revisiting it or if you were embarking yeah. on it today right yeah you know for the first time and I think one thing we've gotten from younger audiences when we've shown it sometimes people say okay well it's like lesbian it is LGBTQI oh, yeah. plus you know and you just have got the first two you got the lesbian and gay but but in a way the film is also a piece of history and in the early 80s that's what it was it was the lesbian and gay movement we actually kind of fought to get lesbian in there at all it was the gay movement and there are a lot of what I think think people who would you know today would consider themselves transgender, but the terms were different back then. You know the way people use language was different, and so you have um, red. You know you, you yeah you have um, red who. Mm. Um, I think to, red is still alive. Do you yeah, that's you right, think? red. Yes, because she was really young when we interviewed her in San Francisco. And Red actually oh. has transitioned and now identifies as he. And and then, of course, Teddy Boutte, who um, I don't oh. know if he's alive, but, you know, he was, oh, I had huge fights with my co-producers about opening the film with the drag queen. And I was just like, that is, who led the Stonewall riots? <laughs> like, drag queens <laughs> are our, our right. you know, soul. So, right. no. right. so, I mean, that's the thing that's like a, a time warp in a way, because, you know, now transgenders, you know, you wouldn't make a film about le you, just lesbian and gay, it would be le LGBT, you know, but, um, but no one talked really about bi back then, because... I don't know. It just wasn't part of the vernacular. I mean, if someone was bisexual, I remember hearing an interview with Elton John, and I think this is how a lot of people thought about <laughs> bisexual. He said he was forced to say he was bisexual. He was never bisexual. He said, I was never bisexual. They forced me to say that. It was ridiculous right. because saying I was gay was too shocking. Bisexual, right. they thought was more palatable, but it was also shocking when he said he was bisexual, so it didn't really help him at all. But anyway, you know, that's kind of how we thought of bi back then, and um, I still do. And um, and transgender, <laughs> sort of, right? like people didn't, people used, um, you know, drag queens, butch women, you know, lots of 
people who would fall under the transgender umbrella now, but we didn't really use the term back then. So that's one change I think mm -hmm. is, is, is pretty big. Um, but I, I sort of agree with Greta, like the film stands up mm -hmm. today. So yes. yeah. Yeah, it is a historical document in itself. Yeah, it, well, and it has become, because you wouldn't believe how many people write and say, can you tell it, they're doing some film on gay history or doing a new version of gay history. And could they, could we lead them to where we got this or where we got that? And basically it's like, well, if you pay me, go well, do your own bloody research. You know what I mean? Like, well, it's not an archive. And I make my living as a filmmaker. And no, I'm not going to give it to you. It's just, it's, it, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. I think doing? one of the things I would do differently, sorry, Go ahead. Um, you know, not as the filmmaker, obviously, but as a participant, I would want to document all the things that were happening around the creation of the film. Mm -hmm. I, mean, yeah. I know we're over documenting everything sometimes now, but yeah. just like I wanted a screenshot of all of us on the screen, yes. I feel like we should be able to document like pictures of us in our meetings. Yeah. Um, you know, some candid shots of people I, when I did the pre-interviews. I would definitely do that now because I think it gives a bigger context to the work, people who are going to look back at the work. Um, I would do that yeah. with my little phone camera. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. You're all exactly right, of course, that this is such a, a historical document in its own right that has to be viewed in the context of that moment in which it was created and what was possible and what was challenging and revolutionary all at that time as well. But I think right. the, the film also, looking at the earliest periods, you're identifying when categories didn't exist. So there actually was flexibility for people to live outside of just gay and lesbian as well. So there is the possibility of seeing that in the film, even if you didn't name it exactly, just by working with the, the archival sources that you had. I found the film too to be really ahead of its time. You mentioned, Greta, at the beginning of our conversation about intersectionality, which of course, the, the term wasn't coined yet when you were making this film, but you are speaking to people that are thinking about their lives and, and you're, you're displaying them in ways that bring in the multiple influences of, 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 of gender, sexuality, race, all of these things in a, 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 at one time. So it holds up really well and contributes a lot to conversations today still. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, and it's funny because I, I think I really found, um, I may, I've made several films since then that are about history and, you know, like women and lesbians in Paris between the war or um, Andrew made a film about the children of Klaus Mann, put it in the gay people in the context of resistance to the Nazis or the South African liberation movement. The man who drove with Mandela was a gay white man. And so I've kept that thread in my historical films that deal with including lesbian and gay lives, you know? I, and the thing is, I think that what the, what the film did was it because there were really very there were like maybe five gay film festivals in the world remember mm -hmm. never was released into just the gay film festival gay film world because it was just a minuscule world right so then um so it was like the first film to receive fun funding from the public television mm -hmm. for a gay history film and it was screened on public television that was just and that was just mind-blowing um and so I think, yeah. Also, just to jump on that, when the film was released was like the kind of early years of the AIDS epidemic. AIDS. Yes. And yes. Um, it was even before, when it first was finished, it was before it was even called AIDS. It was called the um, gay, well, it was called the gay plague, but it was called, it had another thing, gay. GERD, gay, gay immune, immune deficiency disorder. Something yeah. like that. And um so there was a lot of also backlash against the film. It wasn't just like everyone welcomed this film with open arms. I mean, there was a lot of homophobia. There was a lot of anti-gay backlash during the early AIDS epidemic. And I remember Greta, when she was on a TV talk show, they, the host wouldn't shake hands with her, you know, he, because of being afraid of getting AIDS. I mean, there were like a lot of crazy things in that era. Yeah. And so it was you know, it, it, was, it came out into this like real um, time of turmoil in terms of 
pro- yeah. you know, a lot of progress had been made in terms of LGBT rights or L- lesbian and gay rights at any rate. And then there was also a lot of backlash against it. So it was kind of... And- and yeah, and yeah, the thing is, yes, the fact that the film came out right in the beginning of the AIDS crisis, it was like a lot of personal tragedy where Vito Russo became ill, Artie Bresson became ill, um, Peter Adair became ill, and people were dying around us left and right. So it was a really scary time in that regard. Um, I lost a lot, a lot, a lot of friends. The editor of the film, Bill Dalton, died. During you know in like 1985 eight, or 86 you know it was it was dark days but so in a way this was a beacon of light like there is like there's some historical continuity among gay and lesbian people it, you know and and that I had forgotten about that yeah thanks Andrea I think also one of the things and and you um, as a as a professor in history I think are aware how difficult it is to look at something and try to imagine the actual context it was created in. Mm. You're looking at something like a film, like the document, and but you also have to look at how the document's creation is shaped by what's all, the, all around it, from the AIDS crisis to how the, uh, the thing about bisexual, how the culture made famous people, quote unquote, famous people, use the word bisexual in order to soften the blow of homosexuality. (laughs) But that then led us to be dismissive of bisexual people. Actual bisexual people. Oh yeah, that's that's a good point. This whole weird cycle of oppression and, um, but the film was made in a time in which that was the going definition of a bisexual was someone who was covering up being homosexual, you know? (laughs) So later now, bisexuals are really pissed off about that, understandably. But that was the context of how this film got made. And I think it's hard for, I don't want to, people who come later when looking back, I think it's hard for them to understand those contexts. Just like for me, it would be hard to understand something I'm seeing that happened in World War II unless I understand the whole context, you know? Um, so it must be hard to teach this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, it's really exciting precisely for those reasons because people will go in with one set of assumptions and you'll say exactly like what you've just said, Jewel, saying actually there's a whole mess of things you've got to be aware of that influenced how yeah. people came to those beliefs and those assumptions and how that changes. Now, I, can I ask you a question? Now you're of the MA in queer studies, which still is like um, amazing to me. I know. I love it. I love but it. But are most of the students gay or lesbian or bisexual or trans or they or whatever? <laughs> or are they, is it like, you know, a broader... It, in the MA queer history, most of my students identify as LGBTQ in one form or another. Mm-hmm. Um, I've had uh, some students who've applied that are uh, uh, that, that that don't disclose, or I've had some that are in heterosexual relationships. But the students that um, that I've worked with, for the most part, have identified um, as LGBTQ and really invested in learning their history and learning something that 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 impacts them personally. There's a real strong emotional investment. So uh, a, a lot like the people that you're describing that, that then have watched the film and asked these questions about, about the B and the T and where that fits in. Um, that actually got onto a question that was also asked um, earlier, earlier from, the, uh, from, from, from the wider audience watching us. Um, besides those questions about LGBT and how that's changed over time, how has reception to the film changed from the 1980s until now, 35 years later. Hmm. Well, you know, do you want to answer this? No. Okay, well, you know, it was funded by PBS. Partly. So, partly. Partly. Got to emphasize that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we struggled to raise the, all the, the rest of it. But um, it was offered to the PBS stations for free once it gets some PBS funding. And a, a huge swath of the country didn't 
even for free. They didn't want it. You know, they just did not want it. And um, so, you know, it was well received in the places you might imagine, like New York and San Francisco and so on. And and Greta got it. I guess PBS didn't know what to do with all these letters. They they sent most of them to Greta and there were a lot of love letters in there. I mean, they were just like, oh my God, to see my life on screen. It was incredible, blah, 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 blah. But there were also a number of them like, you know, this is disgusting filth. And if you, you know, show anything like this again, I'm going to cancel my membership to PBS, you know, that kind of thing. And um, so at one point, Greta and I actually went on the road and decided we were going to, you know, take the film cans under our arms and show it in the places that refused to broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> We went to, I'll never forget this. We went among our stops. We went to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Oh, God. It was the first time that the arts or film organization co-sponsored something with the gay organization. And it was in a cinema in a shopping mall. And the screening, and this is a real, okay, this must have been 86, 87, 80, 88 maybe. I don't know what year it was, but... It was a real pre-Stonewall kind of experience because when we got to this shopping mall that had the cinema in it, the poster was up, the name on the poster, before Stonewall, the making of a gay and lesbian community. The making of a gay and lesbian community was blacked out. It was covered <laughs> up. They could say before Stonewall, but they couldn't say what it meant on the poster in this town. So that was so crazy. Yeah. And now, of course, that would be like maybe in Pakistan that would happen. But that, <laughs> yeah. you know, now it's, that's a big difference. Well, I mean, it's <laughs> interesting because the, um, the, I don't really know how, I mean, for one thing, the film is now, a lot of it is, it's broadcast or people watch it at home. So you don't really get the actual you know, reaction like you do when the film festivals when we first went out with it. Um, but I think that, um, you know, older people still react like, wow, I can't believe this is really reflected in my life. And younger people say, gay and straight. A lot of, in, in the Berlin audience, a lot of straight people, came, young straight people came up and said, oh my God, I had no idea. Everybody needs to see this film. How can I get it to my friends? How can I show it to my parents? So that's really different, that the that it's not just gay, lesbian people who are interested, but it's a broader audience, which I think is, is interesting. Mm -hmm. I had a great experience, um, I think it was last year, no more than two years ago, probably it was an illegal experience. Um, this friend of mine who's HIV positive, he's, um, he's probably in his late 50s now, he, and he belongs to a, a PWA group. Um, so he rented the film from the public library and invited people from the group to come to this community center where they often have their meetings, and he screened the film, and he asked me to come and talk about it. Yeah. Um, and it was so moving. I'd say maybe there were mm, between 15 and 20 people there. Um, most of them were people surviving with AIDS who were a little bit older. Um, and most of them were white men. They, when the film uh, was over, I would say if there were 20 people there, 10 of them were crying. Yeah. Oh, wow. Because they recognized the loss of all of these people who might have been their contemporaries. Um, there were a couple of people there who were clearly not queer and were you know, more academically interested, and they asked really intense and deep questions. There was, it was so interesting. There was one African American guy and his sister. They were, this was happening in San Francisco. His sister had brought him over from Oakland. He was HIV positive. And she wanted him to have a, a, a good experience with other people who were HIV positive. And he was about 25. And it was really amazing because it was something 
totally alien to him. He was not around a lot of people who had HIV, not a, around a lot of people who were queer. I don't even know if he was queer. Um, but his eyes were like saucers watching the film and listening to people. So I felt like this was a film that was always going to find an audience because it's so um, deeply embedded in humanity that there's always going to be somebody who needs to see it. That's what I felt. Yeah. yeah, I've got another little anecdotal story. I was in Little Rock, Arkansas a few years ago at a thing at a conference for um, atheists in Arkansas who are closeted. So they were meeting in a hotel. They have a conference because they can't, you cannot be an atheist in Arkansas. The, the people uh -huh. in the town or your school or community will come and knock on your door and say, why aren't you in church? I mean, this is serious. So I was showing a film I made about uh, the problem of anti-evolution in America. And this guy who was part of this group came up to me and said, weren't you the one who made the fourth stolen? And I said, yeah. <laughs> he goes, well, I worked at the PBS station then and they wouldn't broadcast it. So we would have parties. We made copies and we just had, and he wasn't even, getting, we had, we made copies and had parties in houses and just had our own screen. <laughs> I just got chills. Oh, I was yeah. like, I don't like the idea of you stealing the film, but <laughs> hey, I'm really glad you did. It was so moving. Yeah. And yeah. It would have been, you know, 30 years before. Mm. You know? Yeah. It is amazing the the impact it can have on people's lives seeing seeing those stories and be able to share those stories amongst yeah. themselves as well. Um, something else that I I noticed in in the film was some of the footage was international, so I saw. Uh, some some footage from the Gateways Club from the film The Killing of Sister George. Yes. And saw some footage from yes. the German film, different than the others, from 1919. Yes. So got some international footage in there. And one of the questions actually that came through was whether you'd considered having um, uh, expanding the story when you were when you were undertaking this to think about gay and lesbian movements internationally and what was going on, or did you do some international research? I suppose that's for Andrea and Jewel as well. If there was international work that went into this, well, we were really um, kind of focused on what led to the Stonewall riots, how this community kind of underground came above ground. So we were really focused on the U.S. Mm. Having said that, I mean, to talk about where the archival footage came from is a whole conversation in, in itself, you know, and it's a kind of like, if you get me started, I might not stop. So I won't, I won't <laughs> talk about it, except for in the briefest way to say that, um, you know, the, we used different from the different from the others. Andres Alciandrin was uh, used to really talk about what happened in Germany. I mean, it wasn't used to kind of represent queer life in the United States. It was specific to that. And the Gateways Club in London, I mean, that was a kind of a borderline choice uh, in that a couple of things that were interesting about that film um, is that the director is American. It was a Hollywood film. I was looking at Hollywood films. In fact, this is where Vito Russo came in to the project. He was really important because he was working on the celluloid closet, his book that was kind of like finding gay moments in mainstream cinema. So he pointed me to a, a lot of different, um, a, a lot of different Hollywood type more commercial films. And that was sort of considered um, a Hollywood, you know, an American film, although it was filmed in the Gateways Club. But the other interesting thing about it was that most of the Hollywood films films in, that we took clips from were kind of used ironically, like Hollywood never got it right. And they, it was always <laughs> kind of a, like, this is how we are represented by mainstream culture. This is not how we really are. But in the case of the Gateways Club, it was, it was more complicated because it was a Hollywood movie using a real place with all these lesbians who were extras in the movie. I mean, it, it was it had a documentary. I mean, obviously, aside from the lead actors in the scene, it had a very documentary quality because these were just lesbians going to the club, you know, <laughs> and the whole like look, that whole butch femme look of the late 60s. It was, you know, so we we kind of poached it, to be honest, because we felt it worked. And um it had that more documentary quality that kind of had a verisimilitude of like real, verisimilitude of real life um, that the ho other Hollywood clips that we used didn't didn't have. Um, 
So, yeah, I mean, the film basically draws on, you know, a small number of Hollywood films because there were not many representations in Hollywood movies. A lot of newsreel archives, a lot of um, instructional or educational films like made by the army or but made by the U.S. government. And then a whole lot of personal collections, whole movies. And so those are the different kind of categories we use. And in doing the home, the thing about home movies and the and personal as archive, that was also I think um, again with seeing Red and Union Maids, that was the first. Those films were the first time that oral history was seen as real history, especially in cinema. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's that wasn't done as an oral historian. You probably know this. It's a relatively new field that someone's personal lives and testimony is seen as history. Um, that it's not just the documents in the dusty old archive. And we had some really hilarious stories where, because we would go into people's homes and we would be looking in their scrapbooks and we'd say, oh, can we, could we copy this picture? And at that time it meant literally you'd have to say, we need to take it from you. Mm -hmm. photograph and return it so we had these forms you know that of liability we would return them and everything um and uh people would be like well that's a that's a, why would you want a picture of me and my boyfriend in bed with santa claus hats on why is that history the total <laughs> not, the opposite of today <laughs> you know and um and one of my favorite stories of that is when we were in in um uh, someone's house in, um, what was her name? The one who got taken? Donna Smith. Donna Smith. So we're in her house and Andrew and I are there and Donna t asked me to go out and get some beer. So I'm like, well, okay, I'll go. And then Andrea comes back. By the time she got us, she was like, I'm going to fucking kill you. She hit on me so hard. <laughs> Why did she say she was here so she could hit on me? And I was just like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't pick up on that. <laughs> I did get the spill. <laughs> Donna Smith was kind of disappointed, I have to say, because, um, you know, I don't know if you remember this, but we kind of left her hanging in the mental hospital. <laughs> we, we, we kind of been telling the story. We kind of moved on to other things and never mentioned yeah. that, you know, she got yeah. released eventually. <laughs> but, um, yeah, we would say things like Donna would say, oh, Val, I, I really don't want you using that photograph. I never liked that dress on her. And, you know, things like that. <laughs> But also, but also, you know, if in the home movies of photos, if there were a number of people in them, we had to find each person because we knew it was going to be broadcast and we had to get releases from every person. And that was a huge, mm -hmm. I mean, it was like a missing, and a lot of times the person who owned the photograph lost touch with them. They didn't know how to reach them. And we, it was basically like, we set up like a missing persons bureau and ba without, mm -hmm. internet, without internet, you know, trying to like chase one lead to another and find out what happened to these people. And then when we finally find them, you know, convince them to sign a release. We mainly, our argument was nobody can recognize you with this photo. Don't worry. It was like 50 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> I, yeah. I just can't imagine the amount of work that went into that. I mean, pre-internet and, and just trying to track people down and yeah, just, it's amazing. The, the effort that went into the creation of this film that would be, I mean, it'd be tremendous effort to do it now, let alone under the conditions that you were working 35 years ago. Um, although then there's some continuities. I mean, when you were talking, Greta, about um, people saying, why would you want to use this picture of us in Santa Claus hats? We have the same thing talking to people today when we're, when we're recording social histories, when we're uh, trying to uh, preserve just this day-to-day -day, uh, uh, experiences that people have that are beyond the extraordinary. Um, well, I'm going to start winding things up. I think we could uh, we could go on for another hour. This has been absolutely um, a delight. But if um, if I could just have maybe a, a parting thought quickly from from each of you, just to uh, I guess to say when I guess I'll start with you, Jewel. Um, well, you've already given us such an amazing anecdote about Mabel, but um, <laughs> I'm wondering when when did you when did you know this film? This is going to be important. This is this is going to stick and do something for a long time. Well, I, hmm, each time I got to talk to a new person about their youth and uh, how they had survived it, and most of them didn't think of it as surviving it. 
they felt like they had led really big, full lives. They'd had a really great time. Um, I'm thinking about Bruce Nugent, you know, he thought him and Langston Hughes were having a ball in Harlem. He didn't talk that much about survival or overcoming obstacles. Um, and I realized at that time we were making connections, personal connections. I was meeting people who were very similar to me and the people that I knew, which is people who were going about their everyday life, which is exactly what the film was trying to, to touch um, and doing whatever it is they did, whether it was writing poetry like Bruce or doing politics like Babel, uh, people were living ordinary lives. And once I understood that, that we were able to get those people and people were willing to talk, I thought this is gonna be important. This is really gonna be important. Um, I don't have to worry that people aren't going to make a connection with the film. I don't have to worry about that. So um, I knew it would be important before I even saw the first rough cut. <laughs> it could have been two hours longer, though, but OK. <laughs> yeah, that was tough. Getting it down to 90 minutes, it was it was really tough. But I had and I have to give credit to uh, the late Bill Doughton, who really, you know, really you know did it was a great editor he, he kept it and that's i think one of the things that, that makes it feel contemporary is that it really moves swiftly you know it's like gay yeah. history 101 it's not like you know now there's been a film about frank kameny there's been films about um other people in the film there's been films about the homophile movement there's been whole films but this was really a sur more of a, a survey uh, uh kind of thing I had no idea the film was going to be so significant, I have to say. I remember the when I was invited to the Berlin Film Festival, and I went there by myself, and I had my 16-millimeter cans under my arm, and I had <laughs> never been to Germany, and I had no idea what I was. And the guy, the late, great Manfred Salzgeber, who ran a program called the Panorama Section of the Berlin Film Festival, and he invited, he had come and seen the film in the editing room on Ninth Avenue, and he was a leather queen. So he's all dressed in leather because he came to see the film before he went out to the bars. <laughs> and then he invited me, and I didn't have a clue as to what was going to happen. But what happened is my whole life changed. I mean, I was became, I was introduced to the international film world. I stayed lifelong friends with Manfred. Um, still good friends with the people who took over his company, still good friends. Actually, I maintained friendships both professionally and personally with virtually everyone on the film, which is, you know, in turn, that was amazing. Yeah, that's definitely really special too. It's great when the film can create so much for the people who create the film as well. Yeah. yeah. So it's, yeah. Really, it's been really heartening to hear those stories and really, just an absolute delight to have had the chance to meet the three of you and to have the chats that we've had in preparation and then and then this evening as well. So thank you so much for sharing sharing this film, sharing your stories and sharing your time tonight. Thank you thank for you. having us. This is great. And thank you Piccadilly for hosting it and for distributing the film all these years. It's I mean, being an independent distributor is not a bowl of cherries. It's hard work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you to uh, Peccadillo. They've been absolutely amazing. And actually, I want to uh, to say there's going to be another Peccadillo Sofa Club. Um, next Thursday, we're joined by Lisa Gornick, watching her 2002 feature uh, debut, Do I Love You?, hosted by Fringe Queer Film and Arts Fest's Josephine Foxter. So come back for that. Thank you all. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.